Hi, I'm Scott Jones. I'm director of the uh, Electronic Frontiers Forums track at DragonCon and virtual DragonCon this year. It's uh, unfortunate we can't be there in person, but we will do the best we can with the technology we have. And I'd like to uh, thank everyone for who is attending uh, virtually. Um, this is uh, Ask the EFF, and we'll spend a little time on Meet the EFA. Uh, I don't see I don't see Fabian in here yet, but let me see. Hey, Fabian just joined us. Okay, he just joined us. Okay, yeah. Okay, there I see the name. Good. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, again, to ask questions, just put them in the chat, or if you want to come on camera, you can um, use the raise hand feature. And the way you do that is to click on your own name and set your status to raise, and we'll look for the hand icon. Um, and then uh, we can call on you. You just flip on your camera if you'd like to do that and, and your microphone and uh, come on if you'd like to do it that way, whichever works for you. And uh, let's see, there's, okay, Fabian, hi. Hey. Hello. Fabian. Hello. How's everybody doing? How's everyone go? Yeah, how's it going? <laughs> Good. Okay, yeah, we're just getting started here, and I was just just uh, starting to introduce uh, what we're doing. We're gonna we're gonna split it up between ask the uh, EFF and meet the EFA. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to put together a um, a more representative panel for the EFA. We'll try to just uh, mention that uh, kind of briefly, uh, but we would like to hear some about what Stop is doing and uh, how they're working together with the EFA uh, when we get to that point. Um, I'd like to start off with introductions. Uh, so if you could, uh, each one, if you could introduce yourself and uh, you know, let us know uh, what your role is in the organization, uh, which organization you're with, um, because there's multiples here, and uh, uh, kind of what you're working on these days. So let's start with Erica. Uh, hi, I'm Eric Portnoy. I'm a technologist at EFF. I split my time working as an engineer on Surfot, which is EFF's Let's Encrypt client uh, that helps people turn on HTTPS for their websites. And I also do a lot of the technical side of our crypto policy work. Uh, what we've been doing there lately has been focused on Earnit and Lido, which are two bills uh, that have been introduced that are not so great for encryption. They have good intentions in mind, but at the end of the day, they're not going to be great for the internet. So we've been trying to put a stop to them. OK, uh, Fabian, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Fabian Rogers. I'm coming here uh, speaking on behalf of the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, which they go by the acronym STOP. Um, basically, I come here to say thank you on behalf of Albert, the founder um, of the company, just because um, our aim, besides doing a lot of advocacy against anti-surveillance um, technology um, in different places from public and well, mainly within the public sector, um, is aiming to avoid any sort of surveillance tech issue or biometric surveillance tech issue within any sort of community that feels impacted. And I actually come from a background of doing a lot of tenant pushback against my landlord from installing a facial recognition. So I come here to say thank you for putting an effort forward to collaborate with many different grassroots organizations in the country overall. Um, it means a lot and it helps the work be a bit easier because it's hard to do it by yourself. So thank you all for having me. Uh, thank you for including us as an organization. Look forward to continuing the work together. OK, Haley. Hi, I'm Haley Tsukayama. Uh, I'm with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, I am legislative activist, so I work on the activism team on legislation. Um, it is my very great pleasure, actually, to work uh, on state legislation all across the country. Um, Right now, I'm, uh, a lot of state legislatures have, have closed business for the year, so I'm working on a lot of letters to governors. Um, but uh, it's, as I said, I get to work with uh, a lot of people all across the country, including the fine folks at uh, EF Georgia. And um, it's, I'm very happy to be here. 
Okay, Kurt? And we're not hearing you. The old uh, mute button. <laughs> Everybody take a shot. Uh, <laughs> classic error. Uh, anyway, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kurt Opsahl. I am the Deputy Executive Director and uh, General Counsel with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I've uh, been uh, with EFF for uh, it's actually about the 16th uh, year, um, and I've uh, been working a lot on the, on the legal side of things. I lead the Coders' Rights Project. That is a, a project where we uh, help people, especially security uh, researchers, with the legal questions surrounding doing security research and publicizing the results, uh, disclosing the results of that research, um, and, and generally try to help people navigate that uh, so that we can get more information out to the public about how to secure our important uh, uh, computer infrastructure and uh, electronic systems. Um, one of the things I, I like to put as a caveat uh, for, for all of these Ask the FDF talks is that while we do uh, represent people for free uh, to help them with their situations, if you have a question about your particular situation, this is not the forum to ask that question. You wanna have a attorney-client privilege conversation about anything dealing with your particular situation, um, and we should have that offline. Uh, if you ever, ever need uh, EFF's legal assistance, you can reach out to info at EFF.org where it will go into our intake system uh, and somebody will, will get back to you. Uh, you know, we're a relatively small organization. We cannot help everybody who uh, uh, may need help, but we will do our best to either help you or find someone who can. Uh, that said, uh, you know, for this, uh, uh, you know, this is the Ask the EFF. It's an open forum to ask your questions. So you can ask all sorts of questions hitting on you know, EFF uh, uh, topics. That would be, you know, privacy, free expression, um, innovation. We will answer them if we can. We have a uh, you know limited selection here in the, uh, on the panel, so maybe that some questions will be outside our expertise. But there's lots of interesting uh, topics to talk about. Uh, some other things that uh, that I've worked on. Um, the uh, recently EFF filed a amicus brief in a case called uh, Van Buren versus the United States before the United States Supreme Court, uh, and this is uh, the Supreme Court uh, addressing. Uh, very important questions about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. That is the federal anti-hacking law. It has uh, some ambiguous terms, and this is an opportunity to resolve these terms uh, so that the CFAA does not uh, put a chill on important security research where somebody might be concerned about uh, accidentally committing a felony when they're trying to just to make computers more secure. Uh, so we're, we're hopeful that, uh, that the Supreme Court will take that case and, uh, and find uh, uh, that what it means through unauthorized access to computers is hacking uh, and that violations of uh, terms of service or, or contractual agreements around a site uh, does not turn uh, your uh, otherwise not hacking access into hacking. Um, I've also been working a bit with, uh, with Erica on uh, uh, encryption policy. Um, and uh, so on the earn it, uh, as you mentioned, a very important issue. There's actually a panel where we're discussing earn it uh, directly uh, tomorrow. I think at uh, what five o'clock uh, Eastern? Is that right, Scott? I'll have to check. That sounds about right. <laughs> uh, so you can tune into that. Uh, it will be a blast from the past because that panel was recorded about a month ago. Um, but uh, but nevertheless, I'll go into greater detail about earn it, uh, and also uh, you know we're just generally trying to make sure that your encryption remains strong and that they're not uh, government uh, mandated backdoors or other uh, encryption flaws that will, will uh, undermine the security of something that we all depend upon. Uh, so I mean, there's, there's lots of things. That, that is wanna... five o'clock, by the way. So uh, five o'clock. Okay. Check it out uh, tomorrow. And I think we're, we're doing a, uh, uh, I guess, a watch party and then Q&A after. Is that, um, so check it out. Uh, so anyway, we're, we'll I'll let it go on to the uh, uh, next uh, a panelist, but I look forward to your questions. Okay, thank you. Um, Nash. Yeah, hello, I'm Nash. I am the Associate Director of Community Organizing at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which means I get to work with all of the folks on this panel today. Um, essentially, with, I, I, I manage the organizing team, and one of the roles that we play at EFF is being kind of the the can do it between EFF and the work that, that we do to protect, you know, pr protecting your rights in the digital world and the Electronic Frontier Alliance, which is a network of 
right now 79 grassroots and community organizations and student groups around the country that largely fit into three kind of major buckets, not, not all, but, um, but largely fit into three major buckets. And today we have two great examples with us. Um, Scott, in addition to his work with DragonCon, as I mentioned, that also is uh, one of the key and core organizers at Electronic Frontiers Georgia, one of the, the probably the longest, uh, maybe, with, maybe tied with EF Austin. Uh, member, you know, associated group with with the FF and kind of even predating the Electronic Frontier Alliance, and then and also um, Fabian and Albert and the folks at Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, and in addition, so that's so those those are advocacy groups. And in addition, in the alliance, we also have a lot. We also have a number of hacker spaces like Crash Space in Los Angeles or Root Access in Fresno that are creating opportunities and spaces for folks to come together and share uh, tools and resources and skills to actually take real control over the the things that they. Own and to and, and to innovate and create, and then of course we also have groups like like um, Cyper Collective in Brooklyn, New York, or Future Ada in Spokane, Washington, that are doing popular education. So really giving folks the the information that they need to make informed choices around the the technology that they own. And all of those groups are completely autonomous. You know, just we we we, sh we come we come together as a network to share skills and resources and tools to make sure that we're able to. To better serve the folks in the, in the different communities and areas that uh, that we're that we're working in, um, but in a way that, that that is appropriate for each community, not under an idea that like you know any any one any one plan is is one size fits all for every community. And so it's really amazing. Then Kurt, Kurt actually mentioned some of the the uh, the principles of the Electronic Venture Alliance, which are really the core things that bring people that bring all the groups together, the thing that, you know, although we are all autonomous, that we kind of coalesce around. And those are privacy, creativity, innovation, access to knowledge, and security. And so really any group that, you know, you have three more folks and you're creating opportunities for folks to come together and, and learn and, and take better control and access to the way that your life is, uh, the, the way that the, the digital world intersects with your life, be it your technology or on the internet or what have you. Uh, those, those are all great groups that, that uh, we would love to, start to work with within the Alliance. And so, you know, Erica and, and Kurt and, and Haley as well, and many of our colleagues with, within EFF are kind of really like amazing, you know, um, um, experts within that really take deep dives into the a really deep dive of knowledge within the areas that they're working in uh, with, with the organizing team at EFF, you know while while we certainly are the, our main goal is to make sure that we're sharing the skills to be able to support the groups and being able to do effective advocacy and education in their own communities which we, but then of course requires us to kind of be have have a, a, a a, a working knowledge of, of a lot of the things that we're working on across the organization and across our issue areas. So it's really, so, so I, it's really for, for someone like me, who uh, it's, it's a really great experience, you know, coming out of, you know, Fabian, Fabian mentioned coming out of kind of like an organizing and the, the work that, that Fabian and his neighbors did in, in, uh, in Brooklyn to be able to stop being their landlord from forcing a face surveillance entry system on them is, is amazing and really inspiring. Um, and so similarly, I come out of a, an organizing background that then would need to require because of in direct action organizing uh, needed to be able to support folks that we were working with and, and realize that the sensitive information that we were being able to, needing to collect to help folks do their interactions with uh, with with the, with the criminal system and law enforcement need, needed to become very um, well informed on the way that digital security um, the way that we can manage that information and secure that information in really reliable ways that's kind of the path that's led me here to EFF where I'm really uh, have have really overjoyed to be able to work and support the work that's happening around the country in protecting folks' rights in the digital world. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I want to. I guess I want to kick off with a first question of my own. Uh, is a little bit foreshadowing what we'll talk about tomorrow. I think we'll go more in depth tomorrow. But uh, I wanted to go back and and talk briefly about the Earn It Act. Uh, that's the act that proposes to modify Section Two Hundred and Thirty. Um, and I heard, I, I saw an alert about changing the uh, Earn It Act to, to uh, give more power to the states and let the states write laws that could, that could individually modify Section 230. Uh, I wonder if, uh, uh, you can, can you give us any more details on that? Haley, have you been, have you been following uh, uh, the state ledge uh, aspects of, uh, of Earn It? Uh, I haven't actually seen many bills introduced. I, you know, we've heard some people talk about it, but um, I think that's that's fairly new. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, as a like as as a, as a general matter, 
uh, one of the the reasons why Section 230, this is, uh, uh, let me say it plainly, Liz, for those who have uh, not been following along, Section 230 is a provision of the uh, Telecommunications Act of 96, specifically the Communication Decency Act that was uh, part of it, that uh, was, it basically said that the soapbox is not liable for what the speaker has said. That, uh, you know, much as, you know, you don't hold the phone company liable for what someone says on a phone call, uh, you don't hold the, uh, the postal system liable for someone who writes in a letter, uh, that uh, you don't hold the platforms liable as if they were the publisher of what one of the users has said. And this law was vital for the creation of user-generated content sites, uh, things like you know, YouTube uh, and uh, you know, Facebook, social media, where the users are generating content and uh, there's more of it than could possibly be reviewed and vetted uh, by uh, you know, legal counsel determine whether it would cause liability. So the paradigm case is if somebody uh, writes something that's allegedly defamatory on a, on a website, uh, you know, to know something's defamatory, it has to be a, uh, a false statement. Uh, and there's very little way for a website to determine if somebody has written a false uh, statement in the ordinary course of things, especially if it's about two people who they have no prior knowledge of. Uh, so without something like Section 230, the websites would be have to be extraordinarily cautious uh, to about what content that they allow, make sure that it is not going to uh, present them with, with liability. Uh, which makes it a free speech issue. That if uh, uh, you know uh, the damages you might have would be hundreds of thousands of dollars, and there was a 99% chance that everything was fine, that 1% of hundreds of thousands of dollars adds up to a fair amount of money, especially over a lot of posts. Uh, and this was you know, one of the reasons why the internet was a big break from the previous systems where there were like uh, cable companies or uh, newspapers who were the conduits through which everything had to pass. Uh, and it really led to an explosion of uh, user-generated content, which I think by and large has been for the good, though one of the things that's happened over the last several years is we've also noticed that some of the uh, challenging aspects and the bad aspects that come from a lot of uh, from content uh, online, and this has put 230 under a little bit of pressure. With all that in mind as a, as a background, Earn It was not about that. Earn It was, hey, you like Section 230, companies well we want you to break encryption so if you don't break encryption we're going to take away this law that you depend on uh so it was really very tangentially actually related to 230 and mostly related to how much companies rely on it but one of the things that is necessary for 230 to work is that it is a single nationwide standard i mean and actually uh it really needs to work in conjunction with other international standards uh, because if you have that the rules are different in every possible uh, jurisdiction, uh, then this was pushing would push companies to have the most restrictive uh, uh, jurisdiction. Um, so I, have, I haven't looked uh, uh, closely at this uh, proposal to have uh, 230 stop preempting state law and allow states to pick and choose how they want to have 230 apply to cases in their states. But I would be very suspicious that the net result of, of a 50-state approach to whether a nationwide or international uh, social media company, online publisher, online platform would be treated for user-generated content would have a net effect of really stepping back on the ability to host uh, um, and if this was like as earner it is uh, uh, as a whole, tied into whether or not they uh, provide the back doors for encryption to law enforcement, um, well, that would make it a, a bigger, unrelated hammer to go after the, uh, the sites. Mm -hmm. And one of my concerns with the 50 state approach is that you could have a situation where uh, sites are held to the standards of the most restrictive state. And that was an, uh, I think that was an issue with the Communications Decency Act also overall before before it was ruled on it, it, it's it's definitely been a historic uh issue with, with decency related stuff or in particular actually obscenity statutes where the standard for what is obscene was a community standard uh which may have made sense in in a time when 
uh, you know, communities were very separated. And so you might have one community that had a, a very uh, lax standard of what would be obscene. Another one had a very, you know, a tight standard of what would be obscene. But this, in the early days of the internet, were, there were a number of challenges around that where uh, people who were opposed to having uh, sexual material online would go and bring their case about it in the most restrictive possible community and then say it violated those community standards uh, and trying to actually as, as, a, as a strategy affect their nationwide goals by exploiting the uh, uh, differences in jurisdiction and picking the ones that fit the best. Okay, I, I see we have a user named uh, Fran who's got her hand raised. You can turn on your camera and your microphone or uh, if, if, that, if you're not able to do that, you can post in chat. Okay, go ahead, Fran. Fran, if you're there. And we also had a, a question in chat about um, voting machines. Hi. Yeah, would you like to take the question in chat? Uh, sure. Uh, so the qu question in, in the chat is, uh, we'll refer to last year, a panel on uh, uh, insecure, easily hacked voting machines. Uh, so this year I saw that the Georgia primary was pushed from uh, March the 3rd to March the 23rd. Are there any other court cases in process or in queue? So um, I, mean, I guess there's a couple of issues being raised there. Uh, one is about election uh, security. And you know we, we do indeed have uh, uh, a lot of a lot of more work to do to uh, make sure that our voting uh, systems are as secure as they as they possibly can be. Uh, you know, we uh, believe that voter verified paper trails is uh, is really the best way to go on that. Uh, a number of states have, have followed into that and uh, uh, started to go in that direction, but uh, not all states, and I believe not Georgia. Georgia still has direct uh, entry. Uh, voting machines, uh, I, I believe, um, and you know these uh, raise uh, some security issues. Now, I, I would note that just you know not to get uh, overly uh, dramatic about this, because uh, to actually have a significant effect on any election, uh, hacking individual machines is a pretty labor-intensive process. It is not something that is easily done. We want them to be as secure as possible. But, uh, uh, you know, this is not to say that you cannot trust the, the results that, that come because these are, uh, uh, it would be extraordinarily difficult for someone to do that effectively. Uh, however, uh, we're also worried about a lot of other things having to do with uh, voting security uh, because one, uh, one goal of those who are trying to uh, disrupt the vote would be to create uncertainty, to create that fear that uh, the votes are, are not being properly tabulated, not being properly uh, counted. Uh, and that can be done by anecdotal uh, things which may not actually have an effect on the, uh, you know, the substance of it, but create that doubt. Uh, so these are some reasons we also need to look for voting security on the security of the tabulation websites, the security of the Secretary of State websites that display the results so that someone can't uh, break into them and uh, try to uh, uh, put in false results. Uh, so these are all things that are, are very important. It may be a little bit less important uh, this year in some sense as states are moving more to voting by mail, uh, which has some pretty well understood security properties. I know there are some talk about uh, insecurity for those, but actually it is a pretty well understood and has been successfully used in a lot of jurisdictions uh, and has less problems than some of the uh, direct entry machines. Um, and the question was also mentioning the pushing the primary. Honestly, I don't know much about that. A lot of primaries were pushed uh, on account of coronavirus to get more time to be able to uh, handle it. And I think uh, I would say more right now should be forward looking, try to figure out in your jurisdiction, whether Georgia or, or anywhere else, that there are mechanisms in place to allow for voting to proceed in a time when uh, there are risks of showing up places in person, such as uh, voting by mail, drop-offs, um, and if uh, machines are being used, and these sorts of things. <laughs> okay. All right, thanks. Uh, Nash, uh, we got the question. I see that you answered the question in the chat, but let's highlight it 
Uh, let's actually bring it out uh, and highlight it on, on camera. Uh, so the question was about Spokane, the organization in Spokane. Yeah, so Spokane, there, there, there is a, a link in, in the in the chat, and I definitely recommend folks taking a look. I was I was really happy to be able to profile uh, Future Aid. Future Aid is, does really amazing work. It is a group in in Spokane, Washington, that was started from um, a group uh, from uh, originally uh, Rebecca Long, who's a technologist who was experiencing you know a lot of problems with you know as as a woman in an industry that is that is male that is extremely male dominated. Um, finding herself, you know, with the folks, you know, whether it be women or folks who are members of other marginalized groups, especially in the tech field, um, the groups that are that are underrepresented, are, are can probably relate to be, be relate and probably are familiar with the experience of kind of uh, what we call an imposter syndrome, right? Where it's it's a, a common. Uh, experience with folks who are members of under marginalized groups in the t in the tech field and other fields as well that feel like their 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 contributions aren't enough that they're they're not they're not qualified enough even though they may have higher qualifications and be more experienced than other um, than other folks that are that are that are not experiencing those same those same problems as a result of their identity and they wanted to, so Rebecca wanted to start a group that could really help women who were who were in the tech field. Be able to feel supported and 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 have opportunities to gain the information and knowledge that they needed to advance in their career, and at the same time, another um, friend friend of VFF who's been a friend of VFF for for long for even before joining Futureda, uh, Emily Saint Pierre, who is moving from Las Las Vegas to Spokane, Washington, connected us with the group, and since then, you know, uh, Futureda has really grown in really understanding the the ways that intersectionality plays, and in that you know when you you know the a rising tide raises all ships, and so they've really expanded ended their work to really make sure that folks who are, who are, who are parts of um, underrepresented communities in tech have the support that they need, that they have the information that they need, and particularly in their own community of Spokane, Washington. And obviously their name is also, you know, uh, you know it sources back to, to Ada Lovelace, who's really recognized as one of the first uh, coders of period, you know, and, and obviously a really um, an inspirational figure for, for a lot of women in the tech community. So it was really great to be able to, to highlight the work that Feature 8 is doing and how they've, some of the challenges that they've experienced and what the, and the work that they've done to overcome those challenges. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, so we're open for additional questions now. If you'd like to put a question in the chat or if you'd like to uh, pop on your camera or, or, or use the raise hand feature uh, by your name, we'll be open for additional questions now. All right. Yeah, you come on. You have a question. I know you do. <laughs> if not, I guess we can start talking about some of the other things that uh, that we're working on. Um, Nash, uh, how about uh, you want to talk maybe about some of our CCOPS uh, initiatives? Sure, I, I would love to. So, folks are folks have probably seen you know, in, in the news over the last of the last several months. There's been, there's been a lot of. Uh, you know, protest and action calling for you know more more accountability in, in the way that that police interact and and you know, so more recently we've seen you know calls for for defunding of the police and obviously EFF our mission is very focused on on technology and one of the things that we've been doing for several years that kind of intersects with some of the things that we're seeing in the news more late, uh, more recently is is this the um, campaigns to make sure that there is an accountability process and that there is a public voice in the ways that different communities are acquiring police uh, so, um, and privacy and based surveillance like Technology, not just for the police, but for all government agencies. Um, and so since 2016, along with partners like ACLU and our EFA members, Oakland Privacy, and as, as well as our Surveillance Technology Oversight Project that Fabian works with, we've been um, advancing what's called uh, Community Control over Police Surveillance or Surveillance Equipment Regulation Ordinances. And what these ordinances do is, you know, a lot of times because funding comes Hello? from, you know, DHS grants or from, you know, maybe it's even equipment that's given. Department of Defense's 1033 program, there is no opportunity for a for elected officials to uh, to weigh in and have a, have a voice in, in the process. And and just as importantly, if not more importantly, there's no opportunity, or, or often, very often, there's no even op opportunity for for to make to be informed for many members of the public about the privacy invasive surveillance technology that's being um, acquired in their communities. Very often, it is just agency executives that are in that process, and usually the only experts, all, very quite often, the only experts that are involved in that process are the folks from the vendors. So there's no, um, there, there's really no, you know, fair or, or a voice that's really looking out for the interests of the civil liberties and protections and rights of the of the people within those communities. So since 2016, 
with the in where it started in Santa Clara, we've been working in passing these ordinances and we passed similar ordinances in, in recently this this year, earlier this year, um, a, a slightly modified version of a CCOPS ordinance passed in New York, very much led by, uh, very much spearheaded by the folks at Surveillance Technology Oversight Project called the POST Act. And while the POST Act is really focused on, on simply on the transparency piece, a lot of the others also have accountability processes, which mean that before, so before a, a police department or any city or government agency can acquire or continue to use a type of, a particular type of surveillance equipment, they need to present a use policy policy, as well as a disparate impact report. So really saying, like, what, are the, what are the conditions under, what are the requirements under which their, their employees will be allowed to use this technology? And also, what, are the pretend, what is the potential for disparate impact against different members of the community? And now when we think about uh, face surveillance, for instance, we know it's been, you know, Joy Bilamwini at, at, um, at, M at in MIT, as in, and now at the Algorithm, Algorithmic Justice Center, as well as Claire Garvey, at um, the Georgetown Center for Privacy and Technology have done really amazing work and really documenting the disparate impact that both on how the technology works in the way it's designed, as well as how it had the disparate um, impact of the way it's being used by police departments across the country. And it really highlighted that, but we really want to think it's also additionally important to, to recognize that even if the technology worked 100% correctly, the threat that it presents to our First Amendment rights to be able to move and, and to go to protest and uh, uh, visit, you know, maybe LGBTQ centers or maybe a religious institution without the fear that we're going to be constantly monitored and that there might be re retribution for, for our ex 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 exercise of our First Amendment protected rights, as well as the, you know, the Fourth Amendment privacy concerns that are, that are inherent in, in the use of the technology, even if it worked 100% correctly, are way, too, are way too high for us to, uh, for us to trade away for some theoretical pre um, presentation of some theoretical opportunity for safety that, has, that hasn't been borne out. And so, so folks may know that last year, in, a, in San Francisco, we had we passed the first face surveillance ban in the country, and so that. But but what folks may not realize is that that was actually passed as a as an addition to um, to existing CCOPS model legislation. And so San Francisco CCOPS ordinance was the first one to actually also uh, include a face surveillance ban. And so subsequently, we've added those to to CCOPS bans that had already been passed in Berkeley and Oakland and. And now, right now, going trying to you know bring, bringing this, the 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 work full circle. You know, when I started off by talking about some of the protests that we've seen in the streets that came out of the murder of George Floyd, and right now in the city of Minneapolis, they're actually have a, have a have an opportunity to pass the most comprehensive and the most protective uh, community control of police surveillance and the most empowering to the people of that city um, community control of police surveillance ordinance in the country. Because not only does it do what the San Francisco ordinance does, which is to to, to provide that that requirement for use policy to provide a disparate impact report to, to require that the public has an opportunity to comment before elected officials not agency executives decide whether that a technology can be used and require annual reporting but it also expands beyond just the surveillance equipment beyond just banning face surveillance but it also in, in, it adds those same requirements for militarized equipment. So, so folks may remember years ago when we were looking, you know, during during the uprising in Ferguson, where we saw um, in the streets in the streets of St. Louis these armored vehicles. And actually, at one point, the Los Angeles Union Free School District had acquired a rocket launcher from the Department of Defense. Why a school district needs a rocket launcher? I think I think we I don't think there's very many people on this call that would be able to answer that. I don't know if even the Union Free School District um, in Los Angeles can answer it because they eventually gave it back. But the the ordinance that's being presented now in Minneapolis Minneapolis actually would add, it's now it's called CCOPS plus M because it also adds those same requirements for militarized equipment. And remember, militarized equipment, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the, the rocket launchers and the, the armored vehicles, but also remember that, you know, things like cell site simulators um, originally were used against enemy combatants in other parts of the, in other parts of the world. Um, which with, with those same with many of those same concerns, mind you, but now they're but now they're being used and here they're, they're being used in in our own communities. So when we look at you know there's 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 a there's a lot a fuzzier line between the militarized equipment and surveillance equipment than folks may realize. So it's important to be able to pass legislation that's going to really recognize that difference and provide those protections for those things that may fit into that gray area as well. So so again so again the the CCOPS ordinance is something that has has obviously led the way for us to make really informed decisions and to create the opportunity for dialogue and a democratic process in the acquisition of surveillance equipment. 
Okay. And X-Ray is saying it must be for the School of Model Rocketry Club. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Uh, uh, rocketry clubs can be a lot of fun. The the key thing though is you want your rocket the rocketry club not to explode when it gets to its destination. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, a failure of that. Uh, so yeah. uh, do we have anything uh, with their hand raised? Um, I don't see any new hands raised. Uh, we only had the one thing in chat. I think one of the things that you brought up, Nash, is um, about protests and about uh, you know, one of the things that came to mind is our digital devices. If we're taking our digital device into something that's that we intend to be a peaceful protest, it's a little bit like a homing beacon. Uh, what what can we do in that situation? You know, to kind of protect our identity, to keep information from that protest from being used against us later. Sure. Well, what, obviously, one of the first things that that folks want to uh, to to really think about is what is their particular, uh, you know, what we call threat analysis. So, like, what is what is their particular risk? And all, for all of us, that's going to be a slightly different calculation. And so, we have, if you look at EFF Surveillance Self Defense Guide, which is at ssd.eff.org, or even the Security Education Companion, if you're that person that's really being called on to share this information with people in your community, which is the way that I, uh, which is largely the way that I first got into this work. Um, the, the security education companion is a great way with resources on how to and how to actually think through your 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 uh, your threat your your particular threat or risk or risk scenarios, but you know so so after doing that you may come to a couple different solutions. One might be to simply before you go to the protest put your put your phone in airplane mode right and so that way you're not actually you know cell site cell site simulators. There's kind of two different kinds. One and Erica is absolutely way more qualified to speak to the, the to the specifics of the of the technology than I. But there's largely there's two different types. There's like there's passive. There's the passive that are simply p picking up information similar to like an FM uh, receiver would and, gra and grabbing fish. And those are very difficult to identify. Um, those are those are almost impossible to identify if they're being used or not. And then you have you know cell site simulators that are that are more um, active that are actually both um, p p that are both picking up as well as transmitting in information. And if and in e in either one of those scenarios, if your if your phone is in airplane mode, then they, then you won't be caught. You know, and, and actually some of the work that uh, that Fabian and Surveillance Technology Oversight Project is doing right now in using geolocation tracking and and are stopping geolocation tracking rather, um, really calls into the fact that when you're using a cell site simulator, it's not just the one person at the protest who you think might be particularly problematic. Every phone in that area is being picked up, right? And so there's there's certainly significant concerns around the ways that folks are being um, are being identified and tracked um, with 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 in, in very unwarranted ways. Um, so by, by having your phone in airplane mode, you are going to prevent that. You may though decide that actually you need to have you need to be able to to communicate during the time that you're there, and that airplane mode in a phone is not going to be the best way for you to do that. And you may have the resources to be able to get a burner phone. Now, if, if you do decide that you're going to get a burner phone, so that it's less, so it's less, so you, you have a greater opportunity for anonymity in your attend, in your attending the protest. There's a couple of things that you're going to want to do and really think through in advance. Though, is one never having your phone that's like easily identified with you and your burner phone on um, in the in the same location, and certainly not having them on in a way that's going to create an opportunity for them to be correlated. Um, because obviously you would lose a significant amount of the of the anonymization anonymization that's provided through the burner phone. Another thing you might want to do if you're going to use the use the uh, the opportunity to put your phone in airplane mode before going to the protest, you might realize that you also need you may also need to be able to recognize where you are um, or identify where you are. And if you go to our SSD guide on protest, you'll see that there's there's a, there's a couple of apps that you can use that allow you to use use GPS and, and the good thing is that GPS is a receive only system and so you can use GPS with while having your cellular transmitter off but if you're going to use one of those apps you will you will have to have thought about this in advance and download maps that can be used uh, with, with those apps that don't require your actually your actual cellular data to be using to be to be on in order to use the GPS mapping feature. Uh, so, there's, so there's a lot, so there's a lot of things you can do, and we have a, we do have an entire playlist specifically for folks that are thinking about attending protests or things or, or, or for activists, as well as playlists for journalists and others 
other specific risk scenarios on our surveillance self-defense guide. So definitely go there. And if you're going to a protest, you might want to even, if you have access to a printer, there's also a pocket guide that we've made that you can kind of fold up and hand out to other folks so, so that if you know others that are attending protests with you, that they can have some of that guidance and um, to be able to think through the way that they're going to try to protect their own, their own, um, their, their own privacy while still being able to, to exercise their first rights, rights and have their voices be heard. Um, so yeah, so so th thanks for thanks for asking that, Scott. And and uh, absolutely, uh, you know, stay stay strong and stay safe. And remember that privacy is a team sport. So the decisions that you're making, you're not just making them for yourself. You're making them for everyone uh, that you're, that you're um, that who's in, whose information has been entrusted to you. Mm -hmm. Kind of like with COVID, you need to protect the others around you uh, yep. as well as yourself. Uh, so Fabian, would you like to add any about the cell site simulators and the situation in New York? Yeah, um, the interesting thing when uh, Nash brings up the geofence warrants is just like the idea of the violation of like your Fourth Amendment right, which is like the idea of particularity and things like that. And the general mass uh, collection of like data is very problematic in a sense. Um, so geofence warrants is like a thing to push back against because the idea of the large mass that like a entity would have to funnel through in order to find the needle in the haystack for whatever perp or whatever um, clue they're trying to follow. So you have that um, in terms of COVID, um, the idea of using COVID-19 as a sort of blanket of, of an, uh, as a blanket excuse in order to push forward the need for surveillance technology to be further implanted in places that generally didn't have that sense of invasiveness um, or that much of an invasive relationship uh, with technology. So like COVID-19 um, tracking and tracing and schools, whether it's campuses or K through 12, that type of problem, or um, the need for uh, COVID-19 tracing within the workplace, um, things like that become problematic. So. I'm still fairly new to the company, of course. Um, I have a general sense that they're pushing back against the geofence warrants um, and the COVID-19 tracing, particularly within schools, both K through 12 and campuses, just from the fact of invasiveness on both sides um, that come at a violation of amendment right, you know, amendment four rights generally, where it's like you're getting too general of information that puts too many at harm um, in terms of their personal um, data in order to try to look or try to preemptively suspect uh, the, the perp that you're looking for, the perpetrator that you're looking for, things like that. So um, I think just because, I, you know, this all falls from the fact that technology moves much faster than legislation, as we all clearly know. Um, that's not to say that legislation isn't effective, it just hasn't caught up to the almost churning uh, workflow of technology overall, specifically surveillance technology. Um, and as Nash brought up, surveillance technology isn't even at a point of efficacy where it's um, where it should be tested in places that really compromise the personal data and personal being of people. Um, what I feel, you know, the general sense of what we're fighting against is the avoidance of allowing um, public areas where people should be free to go about their business. We're trying to avoid those public areas and even private, I guess, areas such as like school areas and things like that, but really public sector, anything that could be handled by government funding or anything like that, avoiding those places to be attack areas, essentially that would deal with very invasive surveillance that we have yet to see ever. Um, you know, since you thought about, you know, surveillance within like the FBI dating back from decades ago to thinking about now. So the idea is avoiding, um, public areas being a test pool for algorithms and um, algorithmic uh, technologies and surveillance technologies to build a sort of efficacy um, through data that they weren't the mind in the first place, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, thanks, David. 
Thanks. So uh, was reminding me, I think, Haley, am I right in remembering that you're working on some state legislation having to do with geofence warrants, perhaps even in New York? Yes, well, we're happy to support STOP um, in their in their efforts there. Um, they have a bill that looks really good, and I think the, the author is very excited about it. So we're really looking forward to working with you folks on that, uh, especially over the over the next session. Um, and yeah, you brought up a lot of issues that are pretty hot right now, actually, in, in legislation across the country. I think if you're thinking about um, the intersection of privacy and surveillance and COVID-19 and sort of all of these state programs, those are um, issues that we're seeing come up in, in legislatures across the country. And, um, you know, in a lot of cases, we're just trying to get, uh, you know, you're certainly right that legislation is often uh, lags behind technology, but we are looking at, at ways to sort of get basic principles, technology agnostic principles uh, on the books, right, to say, you know, don't collect more data than you need to, get rid of it when you don't need it anymore. Um, these sort of really basic things that I think can help uh, deal with a lot of those situations. Okay, we had a we had something in the post about uh, uh, a recent court case finding uh, geofence warrants unconstitutional. Now that was not a Supreme Court case, as I understand it. Um, but that was uh, was it was it uh, appellate or district? Uh, this was uh, two uh, magistrate uh, judges and then uh, uh, district. So these, these are low-level decisions, right? Which is, is actually that that makes a lot of sense because it is the uh, the low-level judges who are approving uh, surveillance technology, right? They, they are they are given a uh, an application by the uh, law enforcement uh, to try to approve it. What they were trying to do there were these geofence warrants where they would get information about everybody in a particular often you know pop, highly populated urban area um, and then try to uh, uh, compare that against the ones that they thought might have uh, uh, committed the crime uh, and the courts were recognizing that that did not have uh, a particularity as Fabian was just was just noting, part of what uh, is is the Fourth Amendment requires is uh, particularity. Uh, that uh, uh, when we created the uh, uh, the Fourth Amendment, uh, you know, after the Revolutionary War, it was a reaction in part to the general warrants of the uh, the British that uh, the the British government at the time uh, would provide a general warrant that allowed somebody to look for whatever they wanted. Right? They didn't have to. Uh, know that it was at this person's house or that they were looking for this particular contraband. They could just have this piece of paper in their hand, bust into one of the colonists' houses, and search it top to bottom trying to find evidence of, of wrongdoing. Uh, and the colonists really didn't like that. Uh, so after having uh, uh, won the Revolutionary War, uh, separating from, from England, they had the Fourth Amendment to make sure that, that sort of uh, behavior uh, would not be allowed. And I think what we've seen both, uh, uh, you know, in geofence warrants, uh, now some, you know, couple of cases pushing back. Uh, the government, uh, uh, I think, you know, still has has time to appeal those. So those may eventually go up the uh, court chain to a point where they are uh, uh, more significant opinions because they're at the appellate level. Uh, so we may actually get some more rulings on that. Though we'll see. Um, there are also times when the government uh loses occasionally in front of a magistrate judge but uh those are not precedential decisions and if they're winning enough elsewhere and they're afraid of what a appellate court or a, a you know a, a higher court would say uh there's a you know no no reason to uh rock the boat unless you think you're going to get a, a favorable uh, you know just as eff we try to find the best cases to bring it to an appeals court well, the government does it the same, though I would say they have more of an obligation to do justice, and that is not particularly doing justice. Uh, I also, since we're on the topic, uh, want to mention there was a uh, speaking of widespread mass surveillance, uh, there was a case that came out yesterday uh, that was addressing the metadata collection program, the nationwide metadata collection program that stemmed from. Uh, some of the uh, authorities uh, seized by the government uh, right after the attacks of September 11th, uh, and the uh, the court found that it was 
and in their words, it was likely unconstitutional, but was illegal. There's, a, there's sort of a notion that courts don't hit constitutional questions and they don't have to. We believe it is unconstitutional, but very importantly, uh, that case also found that, that the people had uh, the right to challenge it. And uh, we've been litigating against the NSA post-9-11 surveillance program, uh, I guess originally in 2006, uh, in the most, the current case actually was dated from 2008, so for a dozen years, uh, and a lot of that litigation is about whether or not we have the right to challenge it, uh, as opposed to whether or not it is lawful. Uh, and so uh, I think this will be a, a useful new opinion uh, on uh, at least uh, whether or not it can be challenged, and I think uh, uh, the court was right that it is likely, in fact, so likely because it is, in fact, unconstitutional. Okay. All right. If there's any other questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, and also, uh, yeah. since the topic of um, COVID uh, uh, tracking apps uh, uh, or contact tracing, exposure notification mm -hmm. apps, uh, and the link that Nash just put in there, COVID-19 and digital rights, uh, we've had a number of posts uh, about the, uh, the, you know, the privacy and, and fundamental rights uh, principles. Uh, they come into play when looking at these uh, contact tracing, exposure notification apps. Uh, and, you know, these, these are things that, that may be helpful in, uh, in stopping the spread of uh, the coronavirus and some people from getting COVID-19. Uh, but we can't do them while sacrificing our, our civil liberties. I think that the, uh, uh, the, better, the better form have been those uh, those apps that are relying more on uh, proximity uh, uh, proximity detection and exposure notification without getting information about uh, uh, your particular locations. Some of the worst are the ones that use GPS and create a permanent track of, of where you've been. Uh, and then uh, to, to hit one of the points was raised a little bit earlier about uh, you know their their use in in schools. Uh, we've had seen seen some circumstances where. Uh, students have been required to use uh, these uh, these apps, including ones that not only require location, but there was one uh, for a, a university that uh, uh, turned out to have security flaws, but yet all the students were were being required to uh, to use it. Uh, so we have to make sure these things are absolutely uh, as secure as they can be, uh, which requires rigorous testing. Um, so this is still an evolving thing. The latest uh, big news on that is that there is the Apple Google uh, protocol, uh, an API uh, originally for doing Bluetooth based uh, exposure notification. Uh, we're starting to see apps rolled out that use that protocol, but also in the uh, most recent version of iOS, uh, I think it's 13.7, anyway, the most recent one, uh, it now has that that built in. You still have to opt into it, so it won't just turn on by default, which is very important. Uh, no one should be forced to use these apps. It should be always optional, uh, but it may actually allow people to use it without an app. How you feel about that is probably related heavily to how you feel about Apple and Google, uh, but uh, I think we have to call upon those companies to be absolutely transparent about uh, how the apps are work and what the safety, security, privacy protocols, and how your information will be protected, so that uh, people can make a decision about whether they want to use them. Okay, we got a question about uh, the voting technology in the chat. Um, so, why is there so much inertia for direct recording and ballot marking device? Voting machines, despite every voting technology expert saying they cannot be audited. Despite this, the politicians keep saying risk limiting audits in the context of DRE and BMD voting machines. Uh, these devices cannot be audited uh, using risk limiting audit methods. I feel like I've talked a bunch, but, I have, <laughs> but I'm happy to at least start. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, go for, go for it. Yeah, and I, I I really appreciate that, and and I think that you know for 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 some time now we've we've really been kind of advocating and pushing for, and there's there's a, there's a clear need, and and Scott and and the folks at the of Georgia where I've worked on this a bit too, and trying to make sure that in the state of Georgia that there actually were voting machines that had 
voter verifiable paper ballots, right? Because because it is it is critically important that that voters be able to have some some level of of assurance that what they're what they're the vote that they're actually entering in is actually what's being recorded, and that not only not only that is happening in the moment, but actually that if you know we, we've seen you know for anyone here that's been to DefCon, I've seen how quickly some some very young and then even experience and, and even you know just just getting their just getting their chops folks have been able to uh to compromise some the vote the voting machines that currently exist so without that without that paper ballot without that that ability to be able to go back and, and run these risks and run risk limiting audits that can give us a, a level of assurance that what that what's been entered by the voters is actually what's being tabulated. There are considerable concerns. You know, I know in in in, in Georgia, for, for as an example, there you know they they I think they ultimately and Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, that they ultimately went with voting machines that did not have that did not have a, a voter verifiable paper ballot. There was some 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 uh, record that was created after the fact, but but that that could also be some really fairly easily manipulated in this work um, without there being a record to be able to go to go back to. So to say that if someone was to compromise the system, these the the, the auditing that was available within. Through through that device would also be compromised, right? And so and one of the problems that we, that that we're experiencing is the fact that one of the reasons that we have this these these problems throughout the country is that this these decisions are happening on a very local level, right? They're they're all happening within com communities and districts. And when there's been and you know after following the 2016 elections, there was there were there was policy that was presented that would have created an opportunity for the for, for both funding as well as guidance to be given from the federal government to assist local to assist local legislators in a, in, a, in, a, in both having the information that they would need to be able to make informed choices around the appropriate um, machines that they should be that they should be um, adopting as well as the funding and and, and um, the funding and support that they would need to be able to do those do things like risk limiting audits that would also, that would provide that assurance and because of because of advocacy from the administration and and elsewhere we didn't get, we didn't get those things. we didn't get those things up. but and so now I'm getting a bunch of feedback in my headphones so, so I don't know if everyone else is hearing that or not I'm sorry. um but so, but now um you know be, because because we lack that we are we are in a position where in many districts throughout the country, we are, we are not going to be able to uh, to have that assurance. Um, but but again, I just want I just want to end, this, end, just end with saying that like I will end it there, and I imagine that Kurt or someone else will want to add on to that. Well, I can speak a little bit to Georgia. Um, you know, we did. It was very controversial. We did um, start replacing our systems. We had the old uh, DRE type systems, and we replaced it. Uh, with a with a ballot marking device system, um, and so uh, okay, they're saying my audio is garbled. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, uh, so we did replace uh, we did replace uh, our system with the the ballot marking device type system. I was uh, you know I was engaged through Electronic Frontiers Georgia and looking at the enabling law. Uh, and I have actually voted with that system um, already. Um, so, you know, basically you would choose your, you would make your choices on a touch screen and it actually prints a piece of paper. And the, the piece of paper has your choices on it and you have to, you have to understand that you need uh, to check that, you need to check that the choices that you made uh, are actually on the piece of paper. But it also comes with a barcode. And we had an enabling law to, uh, basically enable and legalize these machines last year and one of the biggest problems that we there were many problems with the bill but one of the biggest problems was that the human readable portion of the ballot that was printed was not the ballot of record and actually the record was was in, in a barcode so you can't really tell when you're looking at the barcode whether that matches your intent even though you can see the, the human readable portion and what happens is after it prints out you have to put it into a a slot in a device where it goes into a lockbox, and it's supposed to stay secure in the lockbox. But uh, I just don't know. You know, I, I mean, if, if this system, any any voting system is fine until until somebody disputes the results. So I just don't really know what's going to happen uh, once the results are disputed. Um, also, uh, the language of the bill did mention risk limiting audits, um, but. Uh, 
you know, I, I don't know that the, uh, the, the process under which that is, I don't know how, if the process under which that is conducted is a very public process, or if I can go, you know, can I, can I be a part of the process? Or can I see the results of this risk limiting audit? I don't know if I can do that as a member of the general public. So, um, so I, there were a lot of concerns that we had, and, and those are some of the top concerns I remember from last year. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, I did a lot of analysis on the on the voting machines for EFGA, and it, the, it boils down to, <clears throat> in order to do risk limiting audits, this is based on the professor out in California who came up with the theory and the methods of doing risk limited audit, that you have to have a 100% verifiable vote by every voter. So whenever you enter data into a machine, you're hoping the machine interpreted your actions into what you actually meant. And at that point, you no longer have verified that what the machine outputs is in fact what the person intended. They actually did a test where they um, gave people a ballot and said, um, please vote. And the ballots recorded some information correctly. And in some cases, all of the information correctly, in some cases, recorded some bad information. And the idea is, could the people actually detect the errors and were there false positives? And the fact is there's false positives, which is not a problem. You can redo your ballot. The false negative or a, uh, a um, false negative is where you have bad data and they didn't detect it. Then they also did a test of where they encouraged people to check their ballots and they watched how many people actually did. And the typical person took less than 30 seconds to review their ballot. Now, I, I take a paper ballot with me and review mine meticulously every time I vote as best I can. We use direct marking uh, devices as opposed, or direct recording devices, although we moved to the new ones for this election. And it is not possible in 30 seconds to review your ballot. So the bottom line is when given the opportunity, people just don't verify their ballot. And if it's not verified, you cannot audit the ballot. That's a mathematical certainty. So um, the only method we know of, of ensuring that you've actually recorded to the best ability of the voter their actual intention is on a handwritten ballot where they mark in a bubble thing and they record it. That's the only mechanism we know of of capturing it that does not put some kind of technology or recording device or interpretation or multiple levels of interpretation between what the person actually meant and what actually gets recorded. And the only known way of doing a risk-limited audit is with these paper ballots. Despite that, every politician, when they bring up these voting machines, throws the magic fairy dust of risk limiting nodded over the top of it. And in fact, they, the, the author of risk limiting nodded himself says, these machines cannot be audited, just straight up. Whether they print a verifiable ballot or not, cannot be audited, period. Every expert that I know of in uh, voting technology testified before uh, to the working group here in Georgia that gave the uh, final recommendation to the uh, state legislature. And every single person that testified said, do not use these types of devices, use direct paper ballots, every expert. And it was literally the who's who of experts uh, across the country testified to this. And they ignored Voter verifiable. Yeah, yeah, voter verifiable paper ballots is absolutely EFF's position on it as on it as well. And and just for folks that realize we kind of skipped a piece. And just like for anyone who's here that doesn't know what voter verifiable paper ballots, but what what sorry, what risk limiting audits is. Um, I just just wanted to want to like make sure that we're not leaving anyone else behind in the room, right? I'm um, just jumping into the question as it was phrased. And it's essentially, risk limiting audit is a way that you can, depending on what the range is between the candidates. Um, come up with a number or a percentage of votes that you can count that is significantly different, lower than the total number of votes that vote, that will give you a statistically, um, you know, a 90 percent or 90, significantly, but almost close to 100 percent reliability that the that the votes were were entered as tabulated. But as you know, as as we just shared, that does require that the that 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 the votes that are better that what is being tabulated has been very is be able to be verified that it is what the voter submitted and 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 barring a voter verifiable paper ballot um it, it, it is as is, is certainly near impossible to be able to do that 
Okay. Well, um, I'm just mystified by this. Go ahead. Inertia that seems to defy every factual bit of input by every expert you can line up says, don't go that way. And they go, but we're going this way. And it, it it's like they're completely tone deaf to what's being told to them. And this is not just in Georgia. There are alter, other states that have this. So I, I don't work enough in the political process to understand what causes this kind of inertia. Um, I, I can try to address a little bit of that uh, uh, briefly. Uh, a lot of the history here ties back to the uh, the 2000 election where there was a you know hotly contested uh, uh, result in Florida. There were the uh, paper punch ballots with the hanging chads where like a little bit of the paper was uh, not fully coming off of the thing. It was uh, embarrassing, right? It, it was it was delaying the count and said, okay, we got to do something about this. And so Congress passed the Help America Vote Act where they provided something very unusual for the government, uh, which was a uh, funded lack of mandate. Usually people complain about unfunded mandates coming from the government. Well, in this case, they had a whole bunch of money, but no standards. And then a bunch of companies whipped out as quickly as possible. Hey, I've got the voting machine for you. And they created all these voting machines. And then a whole bunch of counties bought them. Uh, and one of the reasons why counties are trying to still use those kinds of voting machines is because they already have them. Uh, and switching to you know, I think a lot of people on the expert size would say optical scan, paper marked by the, the voter, optical scan to assist in doing it, risk limiting audits to d make sure that the, the paper matches the, the electronic tally. Very good system. It's really only a good system, though, if you already have those things uh, and uh, uh, you don't have to uh, throw away all the ones that you have already invested in. So that's a big part of the problem, one that could be solved by by more money plus standards. Uh, but there's been uh, you know some more money coming out of Congress, but for whatever reasons, these things uh, you know get, get partisan. It's difficult to to get it resolved that way. Uh, and there's another issue, which is actually a very important one, uh, that uh, direct entry machines uh, can be programmed in ways that are very, very helpful to people who are voting with disabilities, uh, in ways that, that is uh, more difficult to do with a paper ballot. Uh, you can do some of this with ballot marking devices, but I think there, there's, there's a real uh, uh, genuine uh, uh, effort to try to use some of these uh, uh, more electronic marking methods to allow Greater access to to uh, to voting, easier voting for uh, for folks uh, who have disabilities, and I think that can be uh, can be managed. But that's another reason why uh, you know sort of simply uh, going away from uh, some of the some of these devices uh, raises political tensions. Okay. All right, I wanted to cover the um, one of the questions in the chat um, that uh, was about somebody who's looking for an EFA group and there's nothing listed in their state. Um, so if there's if you're looking for a group in your area and there's nobody listed in your area, uh, what can you do about that? And what's what's the situation there? Start one. <laughs> if, if you if you're you know as I always say if, if you know if you can't if you can't find the group you want to organize with organize it um, so yeah if, and anyone who you know if you're if you're if you live in a community and you've got three folks that are in your area and you know right now obviously in the time of COVID it's very difficult to do like in person meetups but you can certainly you know a lot of folks have now adapted to being able to meet online. And, and you know, there's certainly a lot to be said about the need to kind of close the digital divide to make sure that that's accessible. But um, you know, let's not you know at, at least in this moment, you know, we don't want to make um, per, you know g perfect the the adversary of good. So if you're if you're, if you're able to use the, the tools that are at your resource to kind of bring a couple people in your community together that share the same um, 
that share the same motivation for change that you do, uh, start, start, start reaching out to those folks and find who, you know, who, who's there that wants to, that's trying to reach the, accomplish the same goal as you. And if you need help, definitely go to EFF.org slash fight. And we've got guidance there on, you know, how to do media outreach. We've got guidance there on how to like build coalitions. We've got guidance on there on all of the things, the pieces that you'll need to do that you'll need, um, to really, to familiarize yourself with in order to, to start making that change and reach out to us. The, the email address, that I put into the, the chat there, which is organizing at EFF.org, goes to myself and the rest of the members of the organizing team. And we're certainly there, we're certainly um, eager to help you find, you know, find the, the best way that you can move, um, move you know, privacy, security, creative and innovation, uh, dig digital advocacy in your community or, dig or digital education in your community or, or, to, or to bring folks together, you know, after, after we've come out of this crisis to bring folks together to, to kind of share tools and resources. We're, we're excited to, to support that work. And really, like I said, it's really, if you're a, if it's a for-profit organization, you won't be eligible for the EFA. If you're a political organization because the EFF is a 501c3 and, and is therefore nonpartisan, that wouldn't be eligible. But if you're a community group or a student group or a nonprofit group that's working within your community to kind of to work within those five principles, reach out to us and we'd love to be able to support you in doing that work. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, well, we have, a, uh, I guess, a gap between uh, questions. I just want to make sure uh, we get the, all of the expertise on our panel for you today. Uh, so, Erica, you want to talk a little bit about some of the things that you've been uh, working on? Uh, sure. Uh, well, there's the whole other Earn It panel, so I'm not going to go too much into that there. Um, but I would love to talk about some of the surfbot things that we've been doing because that's been pretty exciting. Um, so the big change that we've been working on lately is a uh, packaging change where we will now we have surfbot packaged as a snap and we're finally deprecating some of the old scripts that we used to have, which is great from a security perspective and from a maintainability perspective. And it will hopefully get it on more people's systems even easier. Uh, so for example, one of the things that's happening now is that uh, Let's Encrypt is doing a deprecation of one of their old forms of the protocol, but old versions of Surfbot only use that version and due to a series of different versions and places and things like that. Uh, actually, older versions, maybe people don't know, uh, everybody in the, in the audience here doesn't know what Let's Encrypt and CertBot is, so could you just give oh, a brief... Okay, yeah, I guess I could at the very beginning, so I can uh, talk about that a bit more now. Um, so if you want to get your website on HTTPS, then you're going to need a certificate. You're going to get that certificate from a certificate authority, which is a organization uh, and some servers that hand out certificates to you. Let's Encrypt is a free and automated one. And along with Surfbot, which is a client side tool for talking to Let's Encrypt, it makes it free, easy, and automated to get certificates to turn your website to HTTPS. Uh, but Surfbot is the client software, which means it needs to run on a variety of different devices. Uh, and so as anyone who has worked in Linux systems is aware, it can be a bit difficult to make sure that things are updated over time, especially when you have a server that's changing things on their end as well. Um, because some uh, Linux distributions are more focused on stability, for example, and so they might have older versions of Surfbot. So the problem that we're hitting is that these older versions of Surfbot won't be able to talk to the new protocol, and we want to get everyone's machines up to date before that deprecation happens, uh, probably around June is when that's going to be happening. Um, so we're currently working with the, um, the, our packagers on those systems to get that fix in now manually by backporting a patch. But in the future, we would love to not have to be able to do that. So there's this new distribution system called Snaps, which it ha has a lot of great features. It has a lot of containerization, uh, which is great for security, and it's auto-updating in ways that are very convenient for both us and for the users. But at the same time, it does enough um, segmentation that it keeps things safe to make it a bit more of a secure way of doing it than just having a randomly auto-updating script, which is one of the very earliest ways that we used to offer Servbot. Uh, so we're almost we're pretty close to finishing up with that transition. Actually, we have Snaps working for a variety of different architectures and systems, and uh, we're working on starting to deprecate the older versions and make sure that everybody is smoothly transitioned from the older version to the newer one 
uh, so we can get people always having the latest version of Serpot that will always be kept up to date and working in the future. So that's been a pretty exciting thing to be working on, although it's certainly not as likely to come up in a question uh, as many of the other topics that my colleagues have talked about today. Well, it is a, it's a very important project. I mean, like uh, before this project started, like it was expensive to get a, uh, a certificate uh, and a lot of people were not doing it because they were didn't want to spend the money, didn't want to spend the time building it. And then through, through projects like Let's Encrypt and CertBot, we took away those excuses, right? I mean, we made it so it was free and easy. And I believe uh, earlier this year, uh, Let's Encrypt issued its one billionth uh, certificate. And uh, you know, this was a tremendous success for the encrypt all the things uh, so that, that CertBot is, uh, is enabling. Oh, I just saw some new numbers today, actually. Let me just pull those up. We have CertBot has 2.4 million installations managing 14.5 million certs for 21.4 million domains. And that's just CertBot, not all of Let's Encrypt, which is pretty exciting. And I'm, I'm always blown away by the percentage of the internet that was encrypted before Let's Encrypt launched and the percentage of the internet that is encrypted now. It's just amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's not even just us. We're not the only people who offer certificates now, but the way that we've helped move the ecosystem forward, because when you move to automation, it really solves a lot of the fundamental problems for both uh, getting and keeping certificates and keeping websites uh, online when they have HTTPS, because if a certificate expires, of course, you're going to have a problem. Spotify had a problem a few months ago, I think, where their certificate had expired. They weren't using Let's Encrypt, uh, but, you know, so they didn't have, uh, it's because when you use a Let's Encrypt certificate, it expires every three months. So you need to have automation because that's way too often to be doing it every time. And, but when it's automated, you don't have to remember to do it every couple of years like you used to have to do. And the total length of time that a certificate is going to be allowed to uh, be valid for is going down to a year. Mm, I don't remember the date, but sometime either just passed or soon happening, maybe next year, something like that. Sometime in the near future or the recent past, uh, certificate maximum lifetimes are going down to a year, which is very exciting for security because you ideally want to get that time as short as possible because if something happens to a certificate, uh, you know, someone hacks into the system and uh, takes a copy of it out to create their own malicious system, you want that certificate to be only valid for a short amount of time uh, uh, before moving on to a new one that they don't have access to. So if we could start bringing that time lower and lower, which we can only do once automation becomes more widespread, we can increase the security of the internet as a whole, even beyond just getting it on HTTPS in the first place, which is very exciting. Okay. Uh, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Haley, uh, I know that you need to leave early, but uh, just one, I guess, kind of parting question before you go. Um, I know that uh, EFF uh, does track uh, legislation at the federal level. Um, but obviously, uh, the state level tracking is going on too. Can you talk a little bit more about um, the state level tracking that's going on, and, and kind of what the effort is, and what the team is like, and, and what your 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 process is? Yeah, sure, happy to. Um, and yes, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to hop off a little early, but thank you all for for letting me come and and uh, talk with you. Um, yeah, so as Scott said, um, you know, we are looking at legislation all across the country. Um, in terms of who the team is, you know, we have a we have a legislative team um, dedicated solely to legislative the state legislation. You're looking at her, um, but it, it is a lot of fun, um, and I really enjoy talking to to everybody. Um, and I really particularly enjoy getting um, suggestions of of bills that EFA groups are interested in and that they are following. I think um, you know one thing that is important to us as we're looking at state legislation is that we really are in communication with people who are on the ground um, who know you know nobody knows how to read a situation um, when it comes to legislation better than the people who are in that community and so I think it's like very very important that um, that we get to talk to folks about that um, and you know sometimes someone will so in terms of process a lot of times someone will say hey this is sort of a, a weird thing uh, you know a bill that I came across um, you know, or this is an issue that I care about and there's a legislator who's working on a bill. Um, and, you know, we, we have those conversations, we talk to those people, we try and figure out, you know, um, 
how we can be most helpful, whether that's connecting them to other resources, whether that's, um, you know, emailing everyone on our list from uh, who lives in that state. That's like one of my favorite things to do um, uh, to just kind of see where uh, EFF can help all across the country um, and, you know, try and support them at, at every at every stage of the process. Um, you know, legislation is it does move in stages, right? You you're drafting, you're going through committees, you're at the floor, you're going to different houses. Um, I have learned more about you know, what different states call their crossover day or, you know, second house day or, you know, whatever, um, when they move from the Senate to the house and vice versa than I ever thought I would. Um, I'd love learning all about weird state legislative procedure across the country. Um, and yeah, just figuring out when we can show up uh, some letters, amplify voices. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a little bit more about the process. Anything in particular I can illuminate? Um, well, I guess I just wanted the general overview. So I oh, thank you very much for that. And, uh, and thank you. I understand you need to drop off. So, um, I do, uh, to talk about a bill because that is always what I'm doing. <laughs> so, but thank you all so much. It was such a pleasure to chat with you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Haley. Okay, um, so I wanted to bring up, uh, you know, if you do have any, we're, we're getting near the end. If you have any final questions you'd like to ask, please put them in the chat or you can use the raise hand feature by clicking on your own name and setting your status to raise hand or you can turn on your, your uh, camera at the bottom. Uh, one thing I would like to mention is if you have questions after, uh, during Dragon Con, but, but after this particular talk, this is our kickoff talk, you can go to the DragonCon Discord server. Um, and I'm posting the link for how to join the Discord server. It is a little bit of a, it is a little bit of a test to see if you can follow all the steps, but uh, you'll have to, you'll have to come into the Discord server, you'll have to agree to the user agreement, and then you have to do something called unlock the rooms. And our room is uh, is in the our room is in the virtual Hilton, just like we're in the real Hilton when DragonCon is actually meeting. There's a virtual Hilton, so you have to unlock the Hilton or unlock all the hotels. Um, but and and the instructions are there on the link that I put in the chat. Um, so I hope you know I I hadn't talked to anybody here on the on the on the conference before, but I hope that if you have a few extra minutes and you'd like to hang out in Discord and answer questions there. Uh, uh, that would be a, a, an awesome, wonderful thing to do. And also, if anybody just has a question, they can post it on Discord during the uh, during the convention, and we can forward it on to the right person if we see it, because we have we have our own people that are watching uh, for questions and things like that out there. Um, so we'll we'll see your questions. Certainly, if it's in the next couple of days during the convention, we'll try to forward it on. Uh, and so. Uh, we're kind of getting close to the end, um, so uh, we'd like to ask uh, uh, for people here, um, you know, if you have any final thoughts, and also uh, if there's any way that we can get uh, connected with uh, EFF and maybe contribute to the cause, uh, please mention that. Uh, I guess I'll go one at a time. Uh, let's start with Erica, and uh, if you want to give us some final thoughts here. Uh, final thoughts. Let's see. Well, um, you know, if you are following the UF EFF, you probably already know some of this, but we send out action alerts and we have our uh, effector newsletter. So if you see anything go by where you're hoping to take action, that's a great way to do it. Um, if, you know, we have automated ways of writing to your representatives and that's, it's not just like a button that you click, that's really like the thing that actually ends up mattering. Um, because at the end of the day, when people, when the representatives hear from the people who they're representing, that's one of the best ways, no matter what we say, how poorly written the bill is or how much it's going to harm cryptography or anything like that, uh, it is really important that they can hear that people are worried about this as well. Okay, uh, Fabian? Yeah, so um, generally speaking, uh, again, stop is just working 
on uh, COVID-19 surveillance within schools and um, geofence warrant, like pushback. Um, otherwise, really great just to see how states have been uh, a part of the paradigm shift in terms of thinking about legislation moving forward. Um, I think the it's really powerful to see like states like Minneapolis take the foot forward and really set a precedent of precedent on uh, what it looks like to advocate against surveillance technology in places that we don't need it and surveillance tracking in places that we don't need it and putting it in the power of the people's hands and making almost civil rights become digital in a way um, and much more uh, state friendly um, on a digital platform. So I'm looking forward to seeing what that looks like moving forward. Um, if anything, there's a lot of updated content on stopspying.org in terms of the uh, company. I might have not put an active link, but basically you can copy and paste that and pop it up on the webs, pop it up on your like web and it should pop up as such. Um, just in case that that's not popping up. Yeah, that's, yeah, stopspying.org. So yeah, there's usually newsletters that pop up. I don't think we do automated um, campaigning. I apologize, we're probably not as hip as uh, Erica, but there's definitely new newsletters that come out, press releases and things like that, that keep uh, folks in touch with what's going on, at least within New York City and stuff like that. So um, looking forward to seeing what the future looks like and thank you for having me. All right, thanks. Okay, Kurt? Yeah, thanks for having me as well. It's uh, uh, great to uh, uh, help kick off uh, this year's Dragon Con with the uh, Frontiers track. And uh, thanks everybody in the audience for, for coming and sticking around to, uh, to hear us uh, answer your questions and talk about these uh, these important issues. Uh, if, you, if you're interested, we have we've actually put a lot of links in the in the chat. Uh, I'll, I'll add uh, one more. Uh, EFF.org, which has just uh, come to our, our website. Uh, you can see our blog. You can uh, become a, a member and donate if you want to support uh, uh, EFF. Uh, just learn a little bit more about what we uh, do. Uh, and I guess, uh, well, Nash, you can talk about this in a, in a second, but as he's pointing out, there's uh, our 30th uh, uh, birthday uh, this year. So EFF has been around. Yes, that's longer than the World Wide Web has been around. EFF. Uh, is from the from the ancient times uh, where people were using uh, dial-up uh, modems and uh, uh, web browsers didn't didn't even exist. But a lot of the important civil liberties issues, the digital rights, uh, remain the same, and uh, we're going to continue to fight for those rights uh, for for another thirty years and and more. So I guess uh, thanks everybody for for joining us. Okay, um, Nash. Hey, um, so yeah, so yeah, thanks everyone. I lo love the questions. Um, and, and really, I love and I hope that folks will follow like follow through and really like to stay motivated to start doing advocacy in your area and either connect with a group that's that's doing work in your area. You can find out more about the Electronic Frontier Alliance at EFF.org slash fight. And again, as Chris Kurt just mentioned, this is EFF's 30th anniversary. So definitely, um, so we've got some really cool uh, things to, to, com to commemorate our, our 30th year. So check out the, the link that I put in there for the um, to, to celebrate our 30th anniversary. I'm also trying to, you caught me trying to pull up a link for the Pioneer Awards because we've got our Pioneer Awards coming up uh, soon, which is an opportunity like that we have every year to be able to really lift up folks that are doing amazing work in the, you know, in the area of, of like, empowering people or creating opportunities for change in, in the ways that our, our digital rights are protected. And I think, um, I'm actually not sure if, I, if we've publicly announced who the winners are for this year. So I'm going to just add the link as soon as I, as soon as I can find it so that folks can just keep an eye on there. I think we're, we were hoping to do it next and then we usually do it in the beginning of September. I think this year we're going to push it back a little bit to October. Obviously everyone's adjusting and adapting to the, the, the moment that we're living in with COVID right now. So um, if folks will bear with me for just a second, I'm going to try and find you that, uh, that link, but yeah, try, try to join us there so you can hear about some of the amazing work that's happened this year. In addition to uh, the work that the work that we've just spoken about that EFF has been, been doing, 
doing. Um, there's obviously amazing work of folks that we really admire. We want to lift up and create an opportunity to recognize them. So I've just finally found the link as I was talking. Um, so I'm going to add that in right now. And so, yeah, so just, uh, Thanks, thanks everyone for the time that you've given. I hope everyone enjoys Dragon Con. Join us tomorrow uh, for the for the session on Earn It, and and just uh, you know keep keep up the fight. Thanks, y'all. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, enjoy thanks, your uh, enjoy your Dragon Con goes virtual. I'll say goodbye to everyone now. Thanks. All right, take care.